Hey, welcome to the stream. I'm Josh Rushing. Government leaders in Uganda and Tanzania say a major oil project supported by French and Chinese companies will transform the region. But environmental activists say it will harm sensitive lands and undermine efforts to reduce carbon emissions from fossil fuels. In the first of three shows related to the global climate emergency, we're going to look at the East African Oil Initiative and see what it means for communities and the environment. Joining us for today's conversation, Ernest Rubondo is executive director of the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, a government organization. He's in Kampala. Patience Nabu Kalu is a climate justice activist affiliated with Fridays for Future Movement. She's also a representative of the most affected people in areas organization. And completing our lineup from the Ugandan capital is Ellison Karuhanga. He's an oil and gas lawyer and is also secretary of the Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. Hey, there's one more person in, in this conversation. That's you. If you're watching this on YouTube, help me out. Join me. See the box over there? We have a producer there waiting to get your comments to me so I can share them with our guests. And you and I, well, we can do this thing together, right? All right, now let me tell you about this oil project. There are two oil fields in western Uganda that are now under development. Uh, what will eventually be the world's longest electrically heated pipeline, and it'll carry crude oil to a point in eastern Tanzania. Export, exports are expected in 2025. Ernest, I want to begin with you. Tell us about the benefits of this project. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to be on the show. Thank mm -hmm. you for hosting me. Well, thanks for being here, the, Ernest. The oil projects are a, and a very exciting and significant development opportunity for both Uganda and Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are very significant because of one, the investment. Uh, they represent over 20 billion United States dollars investment, and this is in comparison to the GDP, for instance, of Uganda, which is about 47 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. They are also significant because they are providing opportunities for employment. Tens of thousands of people are going to be employed on these projects. They also provide opportunities for skills development. They provide opportunities for goods, uh, provision, providing goods and services, that is for companies and enterprises. They also provide opportunities for the training and capacity building of these enterprises. Also importantly, they provide opportunities for technology transfer. Mm. Uh, these projects are not just going to happen in future. We are now seeing them happening. And that's why I said it was very exciting. Ernest? We can see people get... Can I yes, ask please. you, uh, because I've seen these projects happen internationally over and over again, they promise local jobs, but then they bring in experts from other places. Do you have a minimum threshold of the, the percentage of jobs that will go to locals there? Well, we think that's an area that is called uh, local content or national participation, and it's an area that Uganda has concentrated on and Tanzania is concentrating on. Uh, the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, which I head, is charged with the responsibility of ensuring that national content happens the way it's supposed to happen. And I think we are doing quite well because the five areas that we are looking at specifically under local participation is uh, skills development, uh, employment, uh, enterprise development, that's building the capacity of companies, then provision of goods and services by these companies, and then technology transfer. And what we're seeing so hey, far... Er, Ernest, i got to cut your answer just a little bit short so everyone else can get in. Do, do you have a minimum percentage of employment that will go to locals? Has one been set, a number? Yeah. Yes, 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 what, yes. What's the number? The, the national participation uh, that we expect is 40%, uh, and we expect that this is the investment that's going to be made. 40% is going to come to Uganda. And this is not just pulled out of the box. We have experience okay. during the exploration period where we achieved 28%. So now 28%. we're going for 40%. Okay, patient. So, so we're talking 40% going to local workers. Is, it, is, is, that, is that good enough, patients? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Patience. I'm from Uganda, and I'm so excited to be a part of this show. Mm -hmm. And I'm so like disappointed by the, the statements being made by the Petroleum Authority of Uganda because, first of all, this pipeline is to only benefit the rich, especially mm -hmm. those patients. in power and those that have can really access the benefits. 
uh, giving jobs to local communities, I don't think it will be as stated because we have seen this I happening not only like in, in such projects, but even in infrastructure development where they bring experts from other countries because the contracts have been taken off by by uh, foreign countries. And this, I don't think it will really uh, support communities in my in my country. This is, this and is, this when is it comes not to correct. the percentage Josh, Josh, to be Josh, given to the people. Uh, Josh, oh, hold I think on, I Anderson. need to clarify this. Oh, oh. I need to clarify this. Clarify which because point. Let's, let's drill in on this, patients. Let's, let's, let's hear. Ernest, what do you need to clarify? The, yeah, I, I'm just saying that when we talk about local participation, it's uh -huh. two aspects. It has the national participation, which is for the entire country, and it has community participation. Uh -huh. Community participation is also measured, and already we are seeing about 20% of the national participation is community participation, both in terms of employment and in terms of provision of goods and services. These are numbers that the Petroleum Authority of Uganda measures and reports. And we, this is my job. Okay, I want to bring and in so another video uh, here. And, this is uh, a video comment, patients, and I'm going to come right back to you. But this is from Landry uh, Ninterste. He's with 350africa.org, and I think he's touching on one of your points here. Uh, here, roll this. It's uh, uncertain that the uh, oil um, income will pull development in both Uganda and Tanzania for three main reasons. Reason one is that uh, both countries are uh, minority shareholders in the joint project with respectively 15% uh, versus 70% shared between uh, Total and Snow. Uh, it's extractive model, uh, which make it really harder for the locals uh, to be the real beneficiaries of it, and especially the population also living along uh, the pipeline route. The third one is how the, uh, both government, again, are going to prioritize uh, that income. If uh, directed towards uh, priority strategic areas like infrastructure, agriculture, tourism, there could be a real benefit. But if not, the windfall uh, from the project is likely to go to the country's elite uh, going directed into debt and interest repayment. Level consideration of the benefits. So, Josh, so this what, is a lower level consideration. Hold, hold on a second, Ernest. Uh, hold on a second, Ernest. No, no, no. no. Patience, I'm going to let you finish. Wait, I haven't even gotten Ellison into the show yet, Ernest. I, 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 take a pause yes, for just a moment. Fact, Let's get everyone, everyone else in. The facts yes, need to be put the proper. Facts need to be proper. Patience, yes, do you I feel like. Properly. No, I want, I want Patience to finish her quote and we'll come back to you, Ernest, okay? So, Patience, was Landry touching on what you were talking about, how the money will be shared here? Uh, honestly, I want to be frank with people who are viewing us here that the money will not be equally distributed among the people, the people who are victims already. Mm -hmm. Right now, thousands are being displaced. Why have they not been compensated already? A few that have been compensated, it's not equivalent to what they really had before. This is a clear evidence of the outcome of this pipeline. First of all, this this pipeline before like setting it up, it was an uh, like a human violation project. I don't know how much it, they will make this uh, the right way because it is already violating human rights. Children are no longer going to school because their parents that really benefited from uh, Lake Victoria as fishermen cannot take their children to school. Mm -hmm. People have lost jobs, and the jobs they are claiming Josh, to give Uganda and the locals are going to be temporary are. jobs. Josh, These jobs after the pipeline, where are these people to going to go? To the viewers. Eh? Ernest, we, we, you got to hold really on. It's happening, I... and I'm not confident with what is happening. And when we look in the, this whole system, uh -huh. the pipeline is an ecological disaster. It is also not minding the Paris Agreement that was uh, agreed upon. And even uh, the, li the livelihoods, when it comes to human res uh, natural resources, okay, patience. where we uh, see a third, mm -hmm. a third no, of this think, will uh, pass through Lake Victoria. It is already a, a risk to hey, patience, people. You're, you're covering a lot the, of ground. Natural kind of, resources. Hold on, patience. Josh, I want to break this down issue by issue. Hold on, there. Ernest. I want to bring in some people who Josh, actually Josh, have uh, face displacement. Let, let's bring in these two uh, video comments from people who actually have taken a different perspective on displacement. For me, it is not a bad project because it is changing people's lives. The first impacts that I have seen 
Our youths in the village, who were not going to school, they stayed at home and life was hard for them. But right now, because of the project, the youths have got jobs and they have money. That is what I can see right now in my village. Even if the money does not come to me, the youths have it. Some people will say they say they are going to take us to court. So those people say that hey, if they take us, we'll take them to court, they will lose their money. So they decided to sign, but for us, we refused. All right, Ellison, Ellison, I want to go to you. We have one person there who said that some people are benefiting from uh, being moved, and another person who said no, they're going to fight moving. And I also want to bring in for you, this is a comment from our YouTube audience named David Ibong, who says, how would this oil exploration explore inclusive green economy by blending petroleum products with biofuels and opening avenues for energy farming? If so, at what ratio? Can you answer that, Ellison? Before I answer that, maybe if I could just go back to the conversation we've been having, and if I could also say a good evening to those who are watching us, and good afternoon, good morning from wherever they're watching us from. Mm -hmm. I think the important thing is when you talk about the benefits of this project is to give it a holistic, realistic view. We can sit here and say that um, some people are happy, some people are not happy, but ultimately what this project is supposed to do is supposed to to bring development into Uganda. They have just had an argument saying that some of the jobs that are being gotten are temporary jobs, and after those jobs, after those people have done the temporary work, then what happens to them? Mm -hmm. At the moment, they don't have jobs. So are, temporary jo are no jobs better than temporary jobs? We have to understand that if we are going to develop our country, if we are going to develop Uganda, we have to look at development in a holistic manner. We have to understand that we have a resource in this country that needs to be developed. And once this resource is developed, it will bring uh, various benefits. This project is- Can I please talk about fields. development? It is the, it uh, is the construction, it uh, is the hold construction on, just a second, of patience. a refinery. Uh -huh. It is the construction of a pipeline. Those th that, that, that integrated project, it is about um, commercializing gas, making it liquefied petroleum gas. At the moment, the moment we start production, 100,000, metric tons of, of liquefied petroleum gas will be available, which shall help to replace trees that are being which cut will down. Emit you know, we must distinguish we, we must we Ellison? must distinguish between H how many we must distinguish between poverty conservation and environmental conservation. Hey Ellison I'm sorry I like patients very that, much. That that it number you like just threw out a strong case for poverty conservation. Hold on Ellison that number you just threw out how, how many uh, tons did you say they would produce of liquid natural gas? We shall uh, like, produce liquid, uh, I the, think, 100,000 tons itself, of liquefied it petroleum gas immediately. And the, the emissions off of that no, no, would no, be the, over the project, 300 that's million another, that's tons. Another, that's another no, no, no. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Josh. The, the emissions off of that uh, the, that you're talking about would be over 300 million tons no. of emissions of carbon into no. the atmosphere. No, 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 no. Josh, I'll give you an example. If you Google this, anyone can Google this. Norway produces 2 million barrels of oil per day but they are said to emit 33 million. By what science of logic is it that Uganda's 200,000 barrels will emit more carbon dioxide than Norway's? The figure 34 million metric tons of carbon dioxide per year is fiction. It is produced fictitiously. It is the product of imagination yeah. of the highest order. Patience. The fact but, is uh... that the Ugandan oil project will produce not more than 13 kilograms of carbon dioxide for every barrel of oil which is lower than the global average. Patience. The fact is that the, yes. the entire uh, argument against the East African crude oil pipeline is an argument that is really written more fictitiously than Alice in Wonderland. Patience, can you respond to that? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about development and then go to emissions. First of all, Uganda does not need ECO for development. Well, Rather, ECOP is going to just worsen us because once this pipeline is constructed, it is to emit six times Uganda's annual emissions. It is to emit 34 what, what, million that's, metric that's tons of carbon emissions. Well, patience, patience, this is a threat. This is a threat to our communities. Josh, we are already hitting Josh, up. We, Uganda we, is we our top vulnerable so country yes. when it comes we to We need to silence two mics so I can hear patients in the middle. Go, go, Josh, go ahead, patience. Hold on, Ernest. I'm, I'm going to come to you just next, Ernest. I'm going to come to you next. Uganda is a 12th vulnerable country when it comes to the climate crisis. People have already lost their lives. People have lost their cultures. 
People have lost their, their traditions. People have already lost their property. How much more lives should we lose? Already in the parts of Karamoja, it is heating up. People are dying. Our thousands are dying down. And you are continuing to, to support such an ecological disaster, such a climate bomb in a making. I believe uh, leaders should resort to something else. If the Global North really wants development for Uganda, it should invest billions of money in renewable energies because it is actually the cheapest way to use, but they resort to profits, but not the people. They resort to uh, exploitation. They, uh, they, they re resort to continue to continued colonialization of uh, these, mm -hmm. these, these nations. I don't believe with... Uh, the eco project, and I believe this eco project is to Western Africa, not Uganda Can alone. I okay. And will come from here. If we all know you, Africa itself alone is less than Hold on. percent of the total global emissions. But this okay. will. Listen, listen, listen. When we're all talking over each other, no one's catching what anyone's saying. But I'm looking at our YouTube audience right now. We're getting a lot of activity here. Ernest, I'm going to throw this question to you. This is from uh, Alan Charity. And I'm also going to bring in a uh, video comment here before we go to you, Ernest. So stand by for just a second. Alan wants to know uh, from our guest, the government of Uganda and the Petroleum Authority of Uganda have kept all the petroleum agreements confidential secrets from the general public or citizens. I want to know why. OK, now let's bring in Bob uh, Ber Berguet. He is an environmental activist. Here, check this out. Lake Victoria, the largest lake in Africa, is facing enormous danger because of this pipeline that is heated over 50 degrees Celsius. Drilling over 500 wells in Lake Albert has caused disruption in the fish species and the people that live on that lake have no way to have their livelihood. And when you talk about all this, you are arrested. The organization that we work with have been closed we think that the secrecy around this pipeline is unnecessary. Yeah, that was actually a picture of Josh. Bob being arrested there. What's going on with the secrecy of the contracts, Ernest? Josh, the environmental standards, let me just talk about this first. The environmental standards of the oil and gas projects are the international ones set by the International Finance Corporation. This is what happens all over the world. So it's not correct to come to Uganda, which is implementing the same standards, and begin to give the impression that it's wrong. Secondly, as I said at the beginning, the oil and gas projects in Uganda are a development opportunity. They are not a war like these people are trying to present. Because in a war, the f biggest casualty is the truth. What we are listening to here is half-truths. If I go to the incomes before I come to the agreements, the policy of Uganda is not just to focus on the money that will be earned when you sell oil. Mm -hmm. The policy of Uganda is to make maximum benefit of the participation of Ugandans before the oil comes out of the ground. And already we are seeing that out of the $6 billion that has been invested, close to $2 billion has gone to Ugandan companies. No country in the world would not appreciate an opportunity like that. When it comes to the agreements being available, this international standard of transparency is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. This is the international standard. Uganda is a member of this initiative and has made available the documents in accordance with that initiative. Members of parliament have these documents. The people who want Uganda's agreements in the libraries and on the websites need to go to need to show us agreements of countries that are best practice, be it the United States, be it the United Kingdom, be it Norway. Where are the agreements of those countries in libraries on websites? Okay, Ernest, there. I'm going to bring in Peter. So if um, anybody wants Melissa, Uganda's agreements, okay, okay. he's a corporate yeah, affairs office, officer from, he's a corporate okay, affairs so. officer from the Uganda National Oil Company. And here, we'll just check out what he says about national parks in Uganda. The oil and gas projects in Uganda executed based on environmental social impact assessment that have been executed at the highest level uh, internationally. And they aim to, first of all, avoid impacts with the uh, natural habitats that have animals or 
habitats that have human beings and where we can't avoid, we minimize impact. In relation to national parks and habitats of animals in Uganda, only one national park is affected and we have minimized impact to just 0.1% of the land mass of this national park. All right. Ellison, I want to go to you. I'm showing the viewers my computer right now. This is from the New York Times, and it is about uh, the message that came out this week from scientists. Um, I, I just want to read this quote. And I'm going to highlight this on my computer so that our viewers can see it. There is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. This is backed by hundreds of scientists and 195 countries agreed to this. One more part that it says here, the report plainly warns that the world is on track to exceed the threshold, at least temporarily for the first half of the 2030s. That's, that's less than 10 years away. The actions taken during this decade will largely determine what happens for centuries to come. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, called it a, quote, a how-to guide to defuse the climate time bomb. How can opening a new oil project, a new fossil fuels project, not speed this up? First of all, th thank you very much, Josh, for that. And let me try and be quick with my answer. How can opening up a new fossil project not speed that up is, a, frankly speaking, a very simplistic way of looking at it. As we speak right now, the United States of America consumes 20 million barrels of oil per day. We are not talking about a project that is consuming 250,000 barrels a day. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would make more sense if we're asking America to cut its consumption by just a million barrels a day. The world is not livable for some people right now. I had patients talking about Uganda being vulnerable to climate change. We are only vulnerable, more vulnerable than people in Los Angeles because of poverty. We are only more vulnerable than people in Los Angeles because of lack of opportunity. Climate change and poverty are two things that need to be fought together. When what we, what we are being asked to do right now is to say that new projects shouldn't come on board. Meanwhile, historical producers, countries that in the EU, in the United States, that are the people that are consuming 20 million barrels of oil per day should continue. But those of us who are consuming 37,000 barrels should stop. You know so, what's happening, Josh? What's no, happening Ellison, this? You're what's talking happening, about Josh, is this? You're talking about consuming rather than production. And I don't think anyone would disagree with you Even that those Western countries America that you name should lower barrels. their production America and their consumption as well. Yes, yes. But you see, you see Josh, Josh, the point is this. The point is this. Hold on, let's Josh, let Ellison. The point is this. Uh -huh. if, you increase, if you increase, we have seen, if you, if you say that don't, don't bring new oil projects on board, let the price of oil go up. We saw what happened last year. When the price of oil goes up, the only thing that happens is oil companies become richer. Joe Biden said one of the oil companies is richer than God. What happens to the poor people? The higher the price of Josh, oil, I it hits the price. I hear what you're people. saying, Ellison, the but the scientists are we, saying we, we, we cannot add stop, more Josh. fossil fuels the to the problem. We need to reduce it from all countries. Josh, Josh, Josh the scientists, the scientists, are, Josh, the scientists standards, are not Josh. saying... Josh, the oh, scientists oh. have two standards, and I would like to say that... The agreement around the world is that you are going to transition from uh, fossil fuels to cleaner energies. Quickly, Ernest, that's we're coming to a close. That's happening. Now, when you come... When Patience, you come he says that's happening. Is it happening fast enough, moving from fossil fuels to green energy? No, I'm saying it's happening that's differently from each country. Uganda's problem now is not fossil fuels. Uganda's biggest contribution to climate change is the cutting down of forests. And this oil and gas project is actually going to help the cutting down of forests by having that but LPG used instead of charcoal and firewood. So you need to look into the circumstances. Hey guys, I've got to country. stop you there, Ernest. And I want to thank you, Ernest, Ellis, and Patience for being on the show today. But that's all the time we have. Now, look, we're not just looking at Uganda. This is the first of three shows looking at this. So join us for the second show tomorrow where we look at the global climate emergency. We're going to turn to Alaska, where the oil and gas industry has a controversial new drilling project that the U.S. government has just approved. Thank you for watching.